Many thanks. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here back in Helsinki. Um, we've been talking a lot today about how having human rights norms on paper is not enough. And I want to talk today shortly about one case study, one example, which kind of is the tip of the iceberg when it comes to women's rights. One very specific problem which at first had might not seem to be a very big problem, but which symbolizes a lot of human rights issues we can find around the world. When we ask ourselves which contribution international law can make to the improved protection of human rights, of the rights of women in particular, we will sooner or later come to a point where we see that just having a document is not sufficient anymore. In particular, when it comes to protecting those who are most in need of protection because they're most vulnerable be it because of a specific cultural background, be it because of specific structures which exist in a society. This, obviously, in many places around the world still includes women. In an ideal world, the conferences today will not happen. In an ideal world, there would be no instrument like CEDAW because it would simply not be necessary. However, existing general instruments such as the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, or the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, apparently are not sufficient. They should be sufficient to protect the human rights of everybody, yet even these basic human rights obligations are often violated. And in particular, the rights of women often are still under pressure. In fact, they are also under pressure in places where we might not expect it even in rich countries which on paper are very much dedicated to human rights. This raises the question, how can it be possible that even in developed countries which have a very good human rights record, most fundamental human rights of women are neglected even by public authorities? One group which is particularly vulnerable are indigenous women. Indigenous women are in a sense doubly vulnerable as they are part of two communities which have suffered discrimination, discriminatory practices for a long time. Also, they are, in a sense, at the risk of being overlooked when it comes to discrimination against um, women, since they form a minority within women. On the other hand, if you look at indigenous rights in general, it's very easy to overlook the specific situation indigenous women find themselves in. In fact, even countries like Canada, for example, which has a stellar human rights record in general, very much have problems with um, effectively enforcing human rights of women. This has been seen again last week when Canada's parliament um, published a report by a committee which dealt with the murder, the system, and, um, the ma large number of murders, rather, of indigenous women in British Columbia over the last 15 or so years. Rather than investigating further, it now increasingly looks very much like not much is going to happen in that regard anymore. However, indigenous women in British Columbia have long suffered not just a lack of policing or bad policing, but even abusive policing on the hands of the RCMP. And that, in a country that, like Canada, is putting a lot of pride in respect for human rights. Our neighboring country, Norway, for which I have a great love and great respect, is a similarly disappointing case in one respect. Now, a few months ago, news outlets around the world reported a story about an indigenous woman in Mexico who had been forced to give birth in front of a hospital, on the hospital lawn, because she had been denied admission to the hospital. Now, we might want to think about lack of access to health care for indigenous women because they're indigenous is something that maybe is an exception that happens in faraway places, in poor places, and so on. In fact, that's not the case. The reasons why health, access to health care is denied or um, is simply not available might be different, but that is a problem which also is very relevant in the Nordic countries. For Norway, there fortunately has been some research already. I do not know how the situation is here in Finland or in Sweden, for example, or let's say in Canada or the United States or Australia or New Zealand, other countries with large indigenous populations where there might be a similar problem. 
However, for Norway, we have numbers at least. Here in the Nordic countries, we have a sizable Sami minority living in Sápmi, which stretches over no parts of Norway, parts of Sweden, Finland, and parts of Russia. And language which has been conducted in Norway has found that Sami women who live outside the predominantly Sami areas, thanks, are about 40% less likely than Norwegian-speaking women living in the same area to request um, access to mental health care services. Now, that re Norwegian research has also shown that the general standard of health among the Sami population is somewhat above um, the average for Norway. So there might be, you might expect maybe a little bit lower numbers, but 40% certainly is a striking number, even when taking into account that there might be some differences um, in the general health level. The fact that indigenous women in Norway are so much less likely to seek medical help is more than striking. It's only, but at the same time, it's only one example which illustrates a more widespread problem. Research into indigenous peoples worldwide has shown a persistent disparity in the health status among many ethnically native groups when compared to the respective majority groups. Hence, we're not talking only about a problem Sami women have as opposed to Norwegian women, but we find similar problems in other parts of the world as well. Discrimination can have a particular negative effect when it comes to mental health. And here's where a better understanding of other cultures comes in, where it becomes visible why it's so important that we communicate across cultural borders. An inability to communicate in your own language, which in a healthcare environment, in a healthcare setting, in a hospital with your doctor, not only makes it more difficult to actually obtain information about available healthcare services, in the case of mental health issues, it also makes it far more difficult to provide both diagnosis and treatment. Now, even when we take into account that there's a possibility that cultural traditions of indigenous peoples might play a role um, in that context, for example, among the Sami, it's not um, that common to actually speak about mental health ailments. There still appears that there's some, a certain degree of discrimination and or at least language barriers, which at least is sufficient to prevent some women who are in need of health care from seeking the health care they're actually entitled to. This is even more striking in a country such as Norway, which has an excellent health care system. Norway's healthcare system is publicly funded. It actually has the uh, second highest um, expenses per capita for healthcare um, in the world. And Norway has a Patient Rights Act, which makes it very clear that there is a right, an equal right to necessary healthcare. This includes the removal of language barriers. Hence, this kind of case should not happen in Norway if you look, just look at the laws both Norway's international obligations and the domestic laws in Norway. Here is a place where we could see a very specific, and very practical outcome in case of an increased um, willingness of the majority society to deal with that specific different culture. The question then would be whether Norway's existing international obligations might not be enough to ensure the necessary access to health care for everybody. The short answer, however, is that while on paper the obligations um, are fulfilled, while on paper Norway has signed a lot of international treaties, at the end of the day it's all of us who are responsible for, for the failure to create an environment which healthcare is actually accessible to everybody. This responsibility rests with all of us, and that not only with the public authorities. In fact, existing human rights instruments already provide for an equal access to healthcare. For example, the first paragraph of Article 12 of CEDAW indicates that the right to non-discrimination um, not only has a vertical dimension, referring to the relationship between the individual and the state, but also a horizontal dimension, meaning that every member of society has specific um, obligation to contribute to the full realization 
of this human mind. And it's this horizontal dimension that I want to talk about today. Usually, in international law, states have a ob legal obligation with regard to other states. If one state ratifies an international treaty, it has obligations towards the other states, which also have done so. Human rights norms are an exception in so far as they create obligations of the state towards individuals. However, as, as there's a horizontal element to human rights obligations, these obligations no longer are between this are no longer only between the state and the individual, but also between individuals. One of the most important instruments when it comes to the protection of the rights of indigenous peoples is the 1989 Convention number 169 by the International Labour Organization. Article 25, paragraph 1 of this um, convention obliges governments to work towards the goal of making the best health care possible also available for indigenous persons. This does not give you an individual right to access a specific form of health care, but imposes an obligation on the state to work towards the full realization of a universal right to health care. The idea is that there should be no discrimination between the minority and the majority societies when it comes to accessing health services. In a sense, states which have ratified that convention, including Norway, but unfortunately not yet Finland, have the obligation to remove such barriers. While this treaty has not yet found universal acceptance, a much newer document is supported by almost all states worldwide. And that is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This declaration, however, is not binding legally. Yet, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples prohibits discrimination and reiterates in Article 7 the right to life, physical and mental integrity of indigenous persons. Hence, there would be a legal basis albeit a non-binding one, to guarantee access to health care without any form of discrimination. Now, one might think that, at least in Europe, the situation might be even better. After all, in addition to these global human rights instruments, we have the European Convention on Human Rights, which not only is legally binding, but which gives each and every one of us the possibility to take states to court to the European, by bringing a case at the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. However, Surprisingly enough, this is not necessarily the case. Neither the European Convention on Human Rights nor the protocols to it actually include a written right to access to health care. This is different with regard to the Oviedo Convention, the, so the Convention on Human Rights and Biomedicine, which does include such a right in Article 3. Actually, it includes a right to equitable access to health care. However, that right also is dependent on the resources available. However, for most practical purposes, Article 3 of the OVADO Convention could be considered sufficient to actually establish a right to universal health care. However, the OVADO Convention, like the European Social Charter, cannot be utilized by individual claimants in the European Court of Human Rights. Finding such a right in the European Convention itself is significantly more difficult. There is no such right which is mentioned explicitly in the European Convention. And for a long time, there only had been a handful of cases which the European Court of Human Rights actually dealt with this issue. Many of them consider, considered the legal situation of prisoners who demanded a specific form of access to health care. However, in the year 2012, the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights found that applicants who suffer from health problems and who lost their health insurance status due to discriminatory treatment by the state could claim a violation of the right to private life under Article 8 of the European Convention. In so far, there are now indicators in the case law of the European Court of Human Rights to the effect that there is indeed a right to access to health care. If we assume the existence of such a right, it has to be guaranteed by states without any discrimination, neither by gender nor by ethnicity. <coughs> 
that could lead us to the conclusion that, in principle, the lack of language skills should not be a, a barrier to the enjoyment of the right to access to health care. But when, as always, or very often at least with social rights, the question is, who gets to pay for this? Does, does the fact that language knowledge um, should not be a barrier mean that every small town hospital has to provide translation services in every possible language? Does it mean that every doc physician, every doctor in a small village has to have um, a dozen translators and stuff? Of course not. The idea behind social rights in principle is that they're being realized step by step over time. States don't have the excuse to say we don't have money for that, an excuse we've heard earlier this morning, but the idea is that they're not obliged to do everything at the same time. However, the 2012 decision by the European Court of Human Rights has changed the scenario significantly. The European Convention on Human Rights does not give states the opportunity to say, we realize rights step by step. We realize rights in the way that they're available, that in the way we can afford to do so. Rather, the European Convention on Human Rights obliges states to deal with issues right now. Now, the earlier case law by the European Court of Human Rights that I mentioned refers to only to specific discrimination by the state. That's something that, of course, we don't see in Norway. Rather, it's a factual problem um, that can be that's, um, happening on the ground there. However, the European Convention on Human Rights also includes horizontal obligations. This is not necessarily the most popular view, but it's a view which can be concluded from the wording of Article 1 and from the state's obligation to re fully realize the human rights of everybody, as they can be found in the European Convention. In order to be fully effective, the right to access to healthcare has to be both vertical and horizontal, meaning that not only public but also private actors have to take this right into account. While many human rights ex instruments don't make an explicit reference to the horizontal effect of human rights and the horizontal obligations, States have an obligation to implement international human rights obligations domestically. This also requires states to enact legislation to ensure that this right is not denied by private actors. How this can look like on the ground can be very, very different. As I said, yes, it does not mean that everybody has to have access to, let's say, all kind of like translation services at the same time. However, there is an obligation on the part of states to take action to prevent discriminatory practices. This goes one step further than states merely refraining from discriminatory practices themselves. It does certainly not go as far as Article 12, Paragraph 1 of the Istanbul Convention. Article 12, 1 of the Istanbul Convention requires states to take measures to actively end practices, customs, traditions, and so on, which would justify um, violence against women. Nevertheless, states have an obligation to work towards the creation of an environment which facilitates the full realization of human rights. International human rights instruments place direct vertical obligations on states. These obligations can be both negative, states have a duty to refrain from discrimination, and positive in nature. As we've seen today, this is no longer enough. The full effect on the full and effective uh, the realization of human rights, in particular the rights of women, requires the recognition of her, the existence of horizontal human rights obligations. This, however, requires all of us to work together towards the goal of full realization for human rights for everybody without any discrimination. To come back to the question this conference has been asking itself, how international law can contribute to the realization of human rights? Yes, international law remains a valuable tool. It can provide inspiration and can provide a starting point for um, lawmaking on the national level. In fact, in, in so far, what we've heard earlier today from the foreign minister is something um, which Finland can be a role model in many ways. The 
is this idea that human rights obligations should be realized. And where we've been told earlier this morning that the Istanbul Convention will be ratified once the domestic um, legislation is actually in place, that's something that a lot of states should think about. Because very often what happens is that states just ratify an international human rights treaty without ever thinking about how to, ratify, how to implement that domestically. So, and so far, this policy of um, having first the national law in place before actually ratifying something is certainly most welcome. In fact, from an international legal perspective, it's the only way to do that. Because otherwise, the moment the state would ratify an international treaty, it would already be in violation of it if it would only intend to do something about it domestically at a later point. The example I've chosen, the access to mental health care for indigenous women in Norway, certainly is only the tip of the iceberg. As we've heard today, there have been there are many more forms of um, human rights violations against women, and yet it can serve an illustrative purpose. It can show that even in countries where we think human rights are very well served, there's still something that can be done. And it's the obligation of each and every one of us to fully realize these horizontal human rights. Even in the wealthiest states, we remain far from full realization of women's rights, so it's despite a commitment to international human rights law. However, without this commitment, we would be much far away. Thank you for your attention.